The hymn writer summarized the message of the Old Testament prophets when he wrote, Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Hi, I'm Bill Wright. Well, after an extended time away from our book-by-book study, it is so good to be back with you in a walk through God's Word. We'll pick up today in a section of the Bible where few people go. It's a passage that presents a spiritual journey that we can all relate to. Let's join Pastor Dick Woodward right now. Now that we have completed our survey of the poetry books, we come to a new section or a new division of the scripture. And this section of the scripture is one of the sections of the Old Testament that is considered the essence of the Old Testament, especially from New Testament perspective. In the New Testament, you have an expression that occurs frequently, and that expression is the law and the prophets. That's the way the New Testament frequently refers back to the Old Testament. And when the New Testament refers back to the Old and refers to the Old Testament as the Law and the Prophets, what that's saying to us is there are two essential sections to the Old Testament. The first essential section of the Old Testament is the Law, and that is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Bible. And the second essential section of the Old Testament is the prophets. And that's the section we are approaching now as we come to the book of Isaiah. There are 10 kinds of books in the Bible. We've seen this in our survey thus far, and we've mentioned it several times. There are five kinds of books in the Old Testament and five kinds of books in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, you have law books, history books, poetry books, major prophets and minor prophets. And in the New Testament, you have four Gospels or biographies of Jesus, one history book, the letters of Paul, the general letters, and one prophetic book, the book of the Revelation. Now, in between the law and the prophets there in the Old Testament, this means that we have several kinds of books. We have, for instance, the history books, and that is the section of books we surveyed beginning with Joshua and ending with Esther. And then we've just completed surveying the other kind of books between the Law and the Prophets, which we called the poetry books. Now, one of the important things about the history books is they give us historical perspective, or they provide for us the historical context in which the prophets live and preach and very often suffer and die. That's one of the important things about those history books. Remember we said when we surveyed the history books that you want to weave the prophets into those history books because they all fit into the history books somewhere. The poetry books are referred to by the scribes and the rabbis as the writings to set them apart from the law and the prophets because the writings or the poetry books are inspired poetry. But the real essence of the Old Testament is the law, and the prophets. We said when we surveyed those first five books of the Bible that they are the cornerstone of the Bible. That's why we spent so much time with them. Now, as we come to the book of Isaiah and as we approach these prophets, we are approaching the other essential part of the Old Testament. Sometimes in the New Testament, you just have the expression, the prophets. I love that very dramatic moment when the Apostle Paul is in chains and he's defending himself before a king named Agrippa. And at one point, Paul raises his chains to that king and he says, King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know you believe the prophets. Now, when the scripture refers to the prophets or the law and the prophets, it's referring to those prophets who wrote books. It's referring to the prophetic literature. There are many great prophets who did not write books. Elijah is a great prophet, but Elijah didn't write a book. So when the New Testament refers back to the law and the prophets, it's not referring to every prophet who ever lived, but to the prophets who wrote books and to the prophetic literature. Now that's the part of the Old Testament we're approaching now. There are 17 prophetic books. There were actually 16 prophets because Jeremiah wrote two of these books. He wrote the book called Jeremiah and a little postscript to Jeremiah called Lamentations. So even though there are 17 books, there are actually 16 prophets. Now we should get some perspective on these prophets before we survey them one at a time. And that's what we want to do in this first session on the prophets. 
One of the first things we should do as we get perspective on the prophets, these prophets who wrote books, is to compare them to the priests. In the law books, the important leader is the priest. And the real focus is upon this leader, the priest. The leader called the priest was important because he interceded for the people when they sinned. He was also important because he was their teacher. He explained the scriptures to them. He answered their questions about the scriptures or about the sacrifices or the sacraments there in the Old Testament tabernacle in the wilderness or temple of Solomon. Now the priest was born a priest because he was a son of Aaron or Levi. And the priest very often became corrupt and sinful men. Hosea gave us the expression, like people, like priests, like priests, like people. When the people became apostate and sinful, very often the priests led the way in these sinful practices. Now it's pretty much because the priests are corrupt and sinful and the people are apostate and sinful that the prophets appear on the scene. Prophets were not born prophets. Prophets were called to be prophets from every walk of life imaginable. Now, a few of them were priests. Two or three of them were priests when they were called to be prophets, but they were rare. Prophets were called from nobility. Several of them were actually, you know, in the Jewish nobility. They were related to the kings. But some of them were called from very lay capacities, like Amos was a fruit picker and a shepherd, a fig picker, actually. The prophets came from every walk of life imaginable, and their office or ministry was not hereditary. The office of the priest was hereditary. The priest essentially was the man who went into the presence of God and interceded for the people with God. The prophet was a man who came from the presence of God to the people with a message from God for the people. And I think a good way to begin to get our perspective on the prophets is to contrast them with these priests. There's a sense in which you can say, no problem, no prophet. The prophets appear on the scene because there are problems. Now, it's interesting to realize as we come to these books written by prophets, that all these prophets who wrote books lived in a period of about 400 years, roughly equal to the time span of the book of Judges, from about 800 BC to 400 BC. That's when these prophets did their thing. And there is a great reason why the prophets were raised up in this period of Hebrew history. The people were sinful, as we've seen. They were especially guilty of the sin of idolatry. And because of this, the judgment of God is about to come upon them. The judgment of God is about to come upon them in the form of the Assyrian invasion and the captivity of the northern kingdom by the Assyrians. And then the Babylonian invasion, a hundred years later, and the Babylonian captivity of the southern kingdom, which was the result of the Babylonian invasion. Now these prophets, most of them, either precede the Assyrian and Babylonian invasion and conquest, or they function and preach and minister right in the midst of it all. Of the 16 prophets, only three of them come after these captivities and have to do with the restoration and the rebuilding that comes after the return from the Babylonian captivity. Most of these prophets precede these captivities or they minister in the captivities. Now, as they precede these captivities, both the Assyrian captivity of the Northern Kingdom and the Babylonian captivity of the Southern Kingdom, their message essentially is this. First, they preach this way. If you would have a revival, a spiritual revival, if you would sincerely repent of your sin of idolatry, this Assyrian invasion, this Babylonian invasion and captivity could be averted. They preach for revival, they preach for repentance. But for the most part, the message of these prophets goes unheard, unheeded, they're ridiculed, mocked, and very often martyred, and they die because they preach this message nobody wants to hear. Now, when they realize that the people aren't responding to their message, then they begin to preach the invasion's coming, the captivity's coming. And when it comes, it is the judgment of Almighty God upon you because of your sin, of which you will not repent. Now, as we've seen in our survey of the history books, when the Assyrians conquered that northern kingdom, the northern kingdom was taken off into captivity and never heard from again. They're exiled into oblivion. When the Babylonians come 100 years later and invade the southern kingdom, 
There is a message of hope that the prophets preach in connection with that invasion and that captivity. They say, you're going to come back from this captivity. They get a prophetic revelation. They say 70 years from now, you're going to come back from this captivity. And they see that return from captivity, the Babylonian captivity, as an expression of the mercy and the grace of God. These prophets do a couple of very interesting things while they're doing what I've already outlined. First of all, mixed in with their message, you have an emphasis upon social injustice. This is why contemporary preachers like to preach selected passages from the prophets. They cry out a great deal about social injustice. The real emphasis of their preaching, it's fair to say, was not social injustice. It was the sin of the people, especially their idolatry. It was the judgment of God through these captivities. And then in the case of the Babylonian captivity, the mercy and grace and the hope that they held out to the people because of the merciful, gracious return that God brought about from the Babylonian captivity. Another interesting thing that they prophesy is this. In connection with especially the Babylonian captivity, they prophesy dispersion of the people of God into the ends of the earth. And they also prophesy a return from that dispersion. Now, when they do this, when they preach this return from the Babylonian captivity, mixed in with that message, very often you get messianic prophecy. Sometimes they're talking about the literal Babylonian captivity and the return from that captivity that took place 70 years after they were led captive into Babylon. But sometimes they move up into history, up into the time when Jesus came, or even beyond our own day, to the time when Jesus is going to come again. And they give these great messianic prophecies that God's great solution is going to come through his savior, his son, Jesus Christ. And they present the coming of Christ in two advents or in two comings. He comes the first time as the suffering savior to die for the sins of the world. But then he comes again and he comes what we call in the sense of the second coming of Jesus Christ to put all things in order. Now these messianic prophecies of the prophets which get mixed up with their prophecy about the return from the Babylonian captivity this is one of the most exciting aspects of what we call the prophets. Now to further profile these prophets, the word prophet actually means to speak for God. And so a prophet was one through whom God spoke. That's the essential meaning of the word. Now these prophets spoke for God in two senses. First of all, they told forth the word of God or they forth told the word of God. This means they were the great preachers of the Bible but they also sometimes foretold or they gave these predictions of things that had not happened yet that still haven't happened yet, uh, some of them. Now we, when we hear the word prophet, we always think of the role of the prophet, which is like that of a spiritual weatherman. We're fascinated with the foretelling aspect of his ministry. Now that foretelling aspect of his ministry was a very dynamic part of his ministry, but it was a very small part of his ministry. Primarily, they were not spiritual weathermen, they were preachers. And they forth told the word of God with great power and authority. Primarily, the difference between the prophet and the priest in this uh, sense is, the priest explained the word of God, they taught the word of God to the people, answered their questions about the word of God, but the prophets exhorted the people to obey the word of God and apply the word of God to their lives. Now, very often these prophets receive these prophetic revelations of new truth. But for the most part, beginning with Joshua, they preach the written word of God that has already been given. This is why we say that when you're thinking in terms of prophets, Moses is the giant because he got the word, which we call the law, which these prophets preach. Another definition of the word prophet is this. The word prophet is made up of two words which mean to stand before and to illuminate, or to stand before and to make shine. The idea is they took the written word of God and they stood before it and they made it shine. They exhorted the people to obey it. They exhorted the people to apply it to their lives. And this is another meaning of the word prophet. Now, still another approach to the function of a prophet is illustrated in your notebook the work of God is going on in the world, and we've represented that in your notes by a horizontal line going from left to right. Now, when the work of God is going on in this world, and it runs into an obstacle, 
God raises up a prophet. And the primary function really of that prophet is to cry out about that problem obstacle that's blocking the work of God until that obstacle is removed. And when that problem obstacle is removed, now the work of God can go on again. That's the real function of the prophet. That's why we say no problem, no prophet. The prophets all come in this 400 year period because the people of God have never had problems like they have then. The Assyrian captivity, the Babylonian captivity, that's why the prophets come on the scene because there's a big problem. For instance, to illustrate this function of the prophet, the work of God is through his people. And in Elijah's day, and Elijah was a great prophet, the people get turned aside and they get involved in Baal worship. Now, the work of God is off track because they're worshiping Baal. So God raises up Elijah, and Elijah cries out about that problem obstacle, Baal worship, which is blocking the work of God, until that problem's solved, until the prophets of Baal are all eliminated, and then the work of God can go on again through his people. The work of God is on track again. Daniel seems to be raised up to work the people through the problem of captivity. How do you cope with captivity? Suppose this world turned upside down and the international communist conspiracy conquered the free world, perished the thought, but suppose it happened. And suppose we're told that all of those who are disciples of Jesus Christ, if they survive, are going to go to Siberia and dig coal for about three years until they die. Suppose they put padlocks on all the churches and it's illegal to be religious, churches and temples, all religion is forbidden. Now many people would say, well, God's out of business. God can't do anything. And they don't remember that that's the kind of a hostile culture into which the church was born. The church was planted in a culture like that. And the church has never been as strong as it was when it was illegal to be a Christian, the first 300 years of church history. So God isn't out of business when the political power clamps down on you and sends you off to Siberia and closes all the churches. Well, see, this is what happened to the people of God when the Assyrians conquered them, when the Babylonians conquered them. Now, that Assyrian captivity, we say, exiled the 10 northern tribes into oblivion, but the southern captivity by the Babylonians, there was a return from that captivity, and so the people had to know how to cope with 70 years of captivity. So God raised up a man named Daniel, and it was Daniel's function to walk the people through that captivity to show them how to cope with captivity until the captivity ended. Daniel lived throughout the entire 70 years of the Babylonian captivity. He was a teenager when Jerusalem fell. He and Ezekiel were the same age. Ezekiel went into captivity nine years after Daniel when he was about 25. But Daniel went into captivity when he was about 14. Now that teenager who went into captivity was raised up by God as a prophet to show the people how to live in Babylon, which later became Persia. And it was the function of Daniel to show the people of God how to cope with captivity until the captivity was over. If the world turned upside down and we were all taken away captive, the book you want to read if you're on your way to Siberia is Daniel because Daniel will show you how to cope with that. He'll show you how to cope with captivity. That was his function because after the captivity was over and the people knew how to cope with it, then the work of God was able to go on again. You'll find this to be true with all these prophets. You should ask the question as you approach a prophet, what problem was blocking the work of God when this prophet was called upon the scene? And how did this prophet's ministry bring about the removal of that problem obstacle that was blocking the work of God? For instance, in the day of a little man named Haggai, the important thing where the work of God is concerned is the rebuilding of the temple of God. Now, in order to rebuild the temple of God, they have to put up with a lot of persecution. They're opposed when they go back to rebuild the temple after they're permitted to return from the Babylonian captivity. But when the persecution starts, they stop work. And then they get distracted and preoccupied with building their own houses. That goes on for years until God raises up a little prophet named Haggai. And Haggai literally preaches up that temple. He preaches to the people, is it right for you to be building your own houses and living in paneled houses with ceilings and God's house lies in ruins? And he preaches to the people and exhorts them to get back on the job and rebuild the temple of God. Well, whenever they get over their distraction, you know, with the persecution and building their own houses, and they get their priorities straight and put God first and put his house first and their own houses second, 
Now the work of God is back on track again and Haggai walks off the scene. That was his function, you see. The work of God has been derailed. He comes on the scene to put the work of God back on track again. Now you'll see this throughout the Old Testament prophetic literature. A parallel to this in the New Testament is what we call the epistles. A teenager asked me once if an epistle were the wife of an apostle. And it sounds as if it ought to be, but it isn't, of course. An epistle is a letter that the apostle wrote. You see, in the New Testament, the work of God is his church. He's building his church. Now, when problems come up, problem obstacles that are blocking the work of God, his church, God raises up an apostle who writes an epistle. And what's the purpose of that apostle's epistle? It's to cry out about those problem obstacles that are blocking the work of God until the work of God can go on because that problem obstacle has been removed. Now this means that when you come to these prophets, the thing you want to look for is what problem obstacles blocking the work of God? How does the prophet's ministry bring about the removal of that problem obstacle? Now what's the personal devotional application of all this to your own life? Well, God wants to do his work through his people. That's just as true today as it was in the day of the prophets or in the days of the apostles. Now, if you feel that the work of God in your world, where God has strategically placed you, is being blocked by a problem obstacle, if you just form the conviction that God's not working like he wants to work, he's being blocked, pray until you know what that problem obstacle is that's blocking the work of God. Now, when you know what the problem obstacle is that's blocking the work of God, go to the prophets or go to the apostles and their epistles. Until you see that apostle in his epistle or that prophet in his prophetic book describing the problem obstacle that's blocking the work of God in your day. When you see how that prophet cried out about that problem obstacle until it was removed so the work of God could go on, you might have a clue as to the solution to the problem obstacle that's blocking the work of God in your day. And it may be that God wants you to be the prophet who will cry out about that problem obstacle that's blocking his work so it can be removed so that his work can go on. God wants to work in your life. He wants to work in my life. Is it possible that his work in your life, in your own personal life, is being blocked? Well, if it is, you need to come to these prophets and these epistles and find out how that obstacle, that problem obstacle that's blocking God's work in your own personal life can be removed so that God can work in your life again as he wants to work. It's interesting to realize that you need to study these prophets because the problem obstacles that are focused for us in the New Testament epistles are not the same problem obstacles that are focused for us in the Old Testament prophets. God doesn't waste space in the Bible. He's very careful how much space he gives to different subject matter in the Bible. We saw that when we were introducing the scripture. Remember those four gospels? We said there are 89 chapters in these four gospels which give us the biographies of Jesus Christ. What's important about the life of Christ according to those gospels? Well, if you take the 89 chapters in the four gospels, you'll discover that four of them cover the birth and first 30 years of his life, 85 of them cover the last three years of his life. 27 of them cover the last week in his life. So what's really important about the life of Jesus? His birth and the first 30 years he lived or that last week that he lived? That last week is about seven times more important than his birth and the first 30 years that he lived. Space is important to God as he writes the scripture. Now here's where the prophets become important and this is why we should study them. The prophets are the largest section of the Bible there are more chapters and verses in this section of the Bible we're approaching now than in any other part of the Bible. Now, people probably know less about the prophets than any other part of the scripture. And yet there's more space, more chapters and verses given to these prophetic books than any other part of the Bible. If you get on to the fact that God is very careful about how much space he gives in the Bible to subject matter, then you realize we are approaching a very important part of the scripture. This is an important part of the scripture because the problem obstacles you'll find in these prophetic books which block the work of God in your world, in your life, your own personal life, are focused for us in these prophetic books and they aren't focused anywhere else. Now we need to say something about historical perspective where the prophets are concerned. We've mentioned this many times. 
you have a tremendous chronological challenge when you survey the Bible, when you try to put the Bible together. The books of the Bible are not placed in the Bible according to when they were written. They are placed in the Bible based upon their content. Now, this is true all the way through the scriptures. So you have a great chronological challenge. When you come to the prophets, what's the chronology? Where do these prophets fit into the historical books? And what's the chronological order in which these prophets lived and preached and suffered and died? Well, you really have to work that out. And in your notes, we've tried to give you some historical perspective on that. I'm not a scholar, and this is not a scholarly course of study. I'm just a sweet little brown-eyed pastor, and I'm not trying to give you a scholarly approach to this. And I don't want to burden you with history, and especially with dates. But if you want to know what these prophets are talking about, if you want to understand what's on their heart, you simply have to realize some things. Like, for instance, you have to realize that they're primarily concerned about these two invasions and these two captivities. The invasion of the Assyrians and the Assyrian captivity of the northern kingdom, some of them cry out about that. And then they're concerned about that invasion of the Babylonians and the captivity of the southern kingdom by the Babylonians. In connection with that, they're going to talk to us about four cities that fell. You've heard of the book, A Tale of Two Cities. Well, this prophetic literature, in a sense, is a tale of four cities. You see, these two kingdoms that invaded the people of God had capital cities. The capital of Assyria was Nineveh, and Nineveh falls in this prophetic literature. The capital of that other enemy, the Babylonians, was Babylon. These were both very great cities, and they both fall. And of course, in connection with these invasions and captivities, you have the fall of the capitals of these two kingdoms of the people of God. The capital of the northern kingdom was Samaria, and you have the fall of Samaria in this prophetic literature. And the capital of the southern kingdom, of course, was Jerusalem. And the primary focus in these prophetic books will be upon the fall of Jerusalem and the captivity of God's people that took place after that city fell. It's very important to realize that the history books presented to us the rise and the fall of this kingdom of God, the kingdom of God in the sense of Israel in the north and Babylon in the south. The poetry books told us about the golden age of that kingdom. The poetry books told us about the rise of that kingdom. But all of these prophetic books are going to focus upon the fall of that kingdom. All these prophets live in a 400-year period, and they're going to focus upon the fall of the kingdom. They preach during the dark ages of the people of God. Well, again, the application to this prophetic literature is come to these prophetic books and look for the devotional application of the message that was preached by each prophet. Get to know the prophets because as a character study, they will teach you perhaps as much by their life as by their message. So come to each prophet, try to get to know him because you'll learn something about most of them anyway. And then ask yourself, what did they preach? And as they preached their message, what problem obstacle that was blocking the work of God was moved out of the way because they preached? Our study of God's Word certainly takes us to fascinating places, doesn't it? Of course, the most fascinating place is wherever God is working with His people. We learned from Pastor Woodward in our study today that when the work of God in this world runs into an obstacle, God raised up a prophet. And that prophet cried out about the problem obstacle blocking the Word of God until that obstacle was removed. When the Word of God came along in the form of Scripture, we didn't need prophets anymore. We have His Word to guide us. Well, it's been a special treat to have you along with us for today's Mini Bible College program. We so value your prayers for this ministry. Coming next time on the Mini Bible College, a new message from Pastor Dick Woodward. Goodbye for now, and may God bless you and keep you firmly in His loving hands. <laughs>